Hi, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Dr. Donald Pelt, and today we're going to be talking about diabetic foot complications. And specifically, this is a talk that I gave uh, about a week ago to some of the fellows that are in the, in the course of endocrinology at UMass. So what is a fellow? A fellow is someone that's beyond the scope of residency and they're in fellowship training. And here are some uh, tips and, and techniques that we're passing on to them. But you may say, well, this seems to be really advanced uh, for me. Well, it's really not. They're very simple concepts that they're important for everyone to know. And we're going to look at some of the current concepts be behind taking care of diabetic feet and as well as some advanced therapies with uh, diabetes. So this is for you if you have diabetes or know a loved one that has some diabetes. So let's get into it. The objectives are really to learn to diagnose an at-risk diabetic foot, to define the risk factors leading to diabetic foot infections, and to understand the current treatments for diabetic ulcers. And also some, a little bit about the incidence and the economic impact of diabetic foot infections. Uh, for those of you that are watching, you're probably thinking, well, I'm not interested in, in a lot of these things, the economic impact but this really does affect your family and your loved ones that can be dealing with uh, diabetes. So first of all, we're going to look a little bit at what an at-risk foot is. So what is a foot that is at risk for developing a problem? I usually like to equate this to having a forest fire. If you have a forest fire, it's not just going to be a, a, a little match or a little spark that's going to cause the forest fire. Usually you have to have some certain risk factors. You have to have a drought or lack of moisture. You have to have dry leaves. You have to have a lot of extra uh, kindling on the, on the floor. And then you also need to have some type of a spark that's going to cause that problem. The same thing goes with diabetic ulcers or diabetic uh, infections that can even lead to amputation. You have to have all these risk factors that are then going to lead into a bigger problem. So let's look into this. Here's some case studies. This, this patient here, you can see on the bottom of the big toe, there's that little red dot. Do you see that little red dot? That might not look like anything to you, but that little red dot is a callus that turned into a little blister underneath the big toe. What's the problem with this? Well, if this gets bigger and bigger, it's going to create a larger ulcer, we call it, or a wound. So this foot is considered at risk because of that little area of red or that little area of bleeding underneath the big toe area. This is an at-risk foot. This patient also has poor circulation and also has something that we call neuropathy or lack of sensation on the bottom of the foot. So that's the first example of an at-risk foot. Let's go to a different one. Here. You can probably see why this patient is at risk. Uh, this patient has already had an amputation of one of the great toes. Whenever you have an amputation of one toe, there's a much higher risk of developing a another problem on another toe. And as you can see, underneath the same area as this previous foot, there is that blood blister down there. Now that blood blister, it could develop into an ulcer, or it may have an ulcer underneath it. Now what's the reason for this? Well, if you can imagine, if you take off a, a toe and you have less area to walk on, the pressure is going to all go underneath that big toe joint and there's less pressure from the big toe. So the big toe doesn't take any of the punishment when walking, and it causes an area of high pressure or even that blister underneath the big toe area. So this is a high-risk foot, one, because this patient has had a previous amputation, and also because there's another area of high risk underneath the bottom of the big toe joint. You may ask, well, what do you do for this? Well, you have to trim down that callus or that blister, and then this patient needs to go into a diabetic shoe that's going to take off some of the pressure on the bottom of the foot. Uh, here's another example of a patient that has a high-risk foot. There's two things you want to look at that probably point out to you. Uh, first, if you look at the big toe, uh, it has a nail that kind of curves in like this. So if you, if you look, the nail is kind of curved on an angle like this, and, and that's going to cause an ingrown toenail. Also, if you look at the top of the foot, it looks like it has a different color. Uh, you can see some of the skin lines, but it looks like there's a little cut on the top just by the fourth toe. And this is a high-risk foot because that little cut, that little blister, uh, could cause a problem for this patient, and this could be a problem in the future. So he has a couple of issues, one with the nail and also with the top of the foot. This is another example of a high-risk foot. And then here as well, you can see this is the, the kind of the top or the, the front looking on on someone's foot here. 
And what you see with this patient, you see on the tips of the second toes on the right, and, the, and then on the left, the third toe. At the tips, you can see there's big callusing here on the tips. And why is that a problem? Well, if these calluses aren't trimmed, they could develop an ulcer. And if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, that one actually has some blood underneath. Now, what are these caused by? These are caused by toes that are curved down. So these what we would call hammer toes. And because of the hammering, it causes an area of uh, blistering or callusing on the tip. And that's going to be a problem for this patient in the future. This is why this is a high-risk type of a foot. Uh, what do you do for this type of a foot? Well, it, if you can't trim down the calluses or get frequent care and get to the proper, the shoe, proper shoes, uh, sometimes we have to straighten out these toes using a, a little bit of a surgery. And just a little simple fact that I explained to those fellows that I was giving this lecture to, if the toe, if you can take the toe and you can and straighten it out on your own like this, you can straighten it, that's a flexible hammer toe. But if, it, if you can't straighten it with your hand, that's considered a rigid hammer toe. And if it's rigid, you have to take out the bone. If it's flexible, you can sometimes just cut the tendon that's underneath. And those are the kind of the two simple ways of understanding. Most of these patients, if they have a, a callus, it's probably because it's more of a rigid hammer. And then we would have to take a portion of that bone out uh, to help solve that problem. Uh, here's the other area of, of a hammer toe. So if you have a hammer toe, you could have a problem at the tip like that other previous patient. But this patient, do you notice how there's a problem on the top? And so the area on the top here is caused by rubbing on the top of the shoe. It's not caused by the compression stocking that they're wearing. It's caused by the rubbing. And you can see that there's some blood on that area. Uh, if you trim down that callus on the top, you're probably going to find an ulcer in that area. Now, what do you do for this patient? Once again, it's the same thing. You try to trim down those calluses, and you make sure that this patient has a deep enough shoe that's not going to rub on that area. So here's another kind of case study uh, of looking at this. The reason I started this lecture with the case studies because of all these uh, residents and fellows that we teach, they like to have actual practical examples. We're going to get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty uh, in a little bit here. And here's another patient. You can see the bottom of the heel. There is a big callus. Now this callus in the bottom of the heel was caused because of a, because of a previous wound that this patient had, and this wound is healed up. This is considered a high risk foot because of that callus, that really big callus on the bottom of the foot. This callus needs to be trimmed down every two to four weeks in the office. If it's not, it becomes very painful and it could develop into a wound. Also in conjunction with this, this patient needs to have a special shoe with some special inserts that can reduce the pressure uh, on the bottom of the heel. And looking at the side of this patient's foot, you see how there's a lot of swelling in this patient's foot. You can see that because you really can't see the skin lines. So you can tell the swelling. There's also a scab on the side, and, uh, and that scab shows that there's a little bit of a wound uh, underneath it. And this is a, a complex area because this is caused by rubbing, and this callus is uh, trying to heal. This wound is trying to heal, and the rest of that scab needs to fall off before it can heal. This patient probably was wearing a uh, bad shoe, or it could be that this patient didn't have that much swelling, and what happened is the foot became swollen, and when it became swollen, it, it rubbed on the side of the shoe. And that friction caused that callus, caused a blister, caused an ulcer, and that, that's needing to heal. Okay, this is a very high-risk foot because, once again, if you've had an amputation or if you've had a wound in the past, you're much more likely to develop another wound in that area. This is another example of a patient with a wound on the front of the leg. This is an area of concern and a high-risk foot, but we're looking at the leg. You're saying, well, it's not, it's not a foot. Well, the foot's attached to the, uh, this leg here, and there's a problem. You can see all that redness going around. So this patient simply uh, injured the front of their leg by hitting it on something. It opened up a cut, and that cut caused some redness all around that area. That redness is called cellulitis. If this isn't taken care of with an antibiotic or treated properly, uh, this could cause this patient to lose their foot and their leg. Another example, this is what we do around the edges of an area of cellulitis. We mark it with a marker uh, to determine if that redness is either going beyond where the marker is or if it's subsiding. If it's subsiding, that means the infection is getting better. If it gets wider, it means that infection is getting worse. So let's look here 
more at some of the technical aspects of the diabetic foot and some of the risk factors. And these are the components of something that we call a diabetic foot examination. What is that? that well, a diabetic foot exam is something that your doctor should be doing, whether it be your primary care doctor, if they're taking care of your diabetes, or your endocrinologist, but most certainly the doctor that, that could be and should be doing this is a podiatrist or some type of a foot specialist. When you look at uh, a diabetic foot exam, there's different components. You have to look at a dermatological, and all that means is the skin. So you have to look at the skin. You have to look at the nerves, or you can't really look at the nerves, but you have to test the nerves. You have to look at the osseous, which are the bones in that area. Uh, the vascular, which is the circulation in that area. And then you also have to look at the shoe gear considerations. And because this was a lecture, I put some of the references, if you're interested, at the bottom here. You can look at the references uh, for this information. Let's first look at some of the skin considerations. So dermatological are the skin. With diabetics, dry skin is something that can be a problem because a, a dry skin area could develop into a fissure or a crack. Here's an example of a patient with a crack on the bottom of the heel that developed that, that fissure or that opening, and that can be a problem. Now, just so you know, a lot of people that don't have diabetes uh, have these fissures in the wintertime. This is very common, and it's not a big risk like it is for a diabetic. If, if you maybe have a crack or dry heels and they crack a little bit, Usually with a good moisturizer, that's enough to heal it. But for people that have diabetes, there's, there's more of a risk, probably because you have a poor circulation, you may have elevated blood sugar, and these things can make these wounds a little bit slower to heal. Now this is an interesting example of this patient because they had these little cracks here and you see all that dry skin. If you put a normal skin moisturizer on this, you know what's gonna happen to those little cracks? those little cracks are actually going to open up and they're going to appear a lot bigger because the dryness of the skin is actually helping those cracks to stay small. So dry skin, that's just one example on the heel. You could have dry skin other places. Looking at a, a fungal infection, many times dry skin can be mistaken as a fungal infection or a fungal infection can be mistaken as dry skin. So the easiest rule of thumb is that if you're using a skin moisturizer, and the best moisturizer for people with diabetes uh, is a urea-based cream, U-R-E-A. That's a type of a cream that has urea as the active component, and that can help dry, take this dry skin and moisturize it. And if you want to make it work even better, you can put on the urea cream and then put a pair of socks on. If you want to make it even better, you can put the urea cream Take some plastic wrap that you have at home, wrap your foot up, and then put it into a sock. And that makes it work much better. There are some special socks that have some, have some gel in them, and, and those can be helpful as well for patients. Now, one caveat to that, with these creams, you don't want to put it between your toes if you are a diabetic. Using a cream between the toes can actually cause some maceration. But let's go on to a fungal infection. If you think you have a fungal infection between the toes, there are difficult, different... Uh, antifungals that you can place between there. Uh, you can do it on the bottom of the foot, between the toes. Now, just something to be aware of, a lot of times with a fungal infection between the toes, you might be misinterpreting the problem. Sometimes a fungal infection between the toes can look very damp and very white, and it can be what we call macerated. And with that maceration, you need to actually dry out between the toes and not use an antifungal. So there are some different drying agents. So basically, if you have a problem between the toes and you're diabetic, you should get some professional help. You shouldn't just try a different cream. Uh, if, it, if it is diagnosed that it is a simple uh, fungal infection between there, there are uh, special types of medications. And, it, and it's interesting because the medication that you should use between the toes is a little bit different than you should use in the bottom of the foot. The one that you can use between the toes is actually a gel. There are some antifungal gels that are by prescription, and you may ask, well, why should I use a gel between the toes? Well, if you put a cream between the toes, what, what's it going to do to the moisture? It's actually going to make it uh, more moist and even make it more disposed to getting a fungal infection or moisture or humidity between there. But how about a gel? What happens with a gel, just like in your hair, 
if you put the gel in your hair, the gel actually evaporates and it leaves the component that, that causes it to work in your hair. And it's the same thing between the toes. When you put that medication between the toes, it actually will dry up and evaporate because of the gel, because of that high alcohol content, and it'll leave the medication between there. But once again, this type of a medication is only by a prescription and be very careful just putting a normal cream between the toes. You, you shouldn't be doing that unless it's one that is recommended by your doctor. Something else to look at in terms of callusing here are, are these, uh, these uh, the skin, I'm sorry, is the callus. And there's two different types of callus. As you can see, the one callus on the left side is a, a very kind of a circular uh, lesion there, and the other one covers the whole bottom of the, of the big toe joint. So first of all, the one on the left is something we call a Oroceratoma. And basically, the easiest way to explain it is it's a clogged sweat gland. So you have a sweat gland that can get a really focal area of callus in there. And the only way to treat that is for a doctor to go in there and scoop that out. Now, normally, these come back. They come back very frequently, and they're typically found on areas of high pressure. An area of high pressure on your foot, you find one of these, you scoop it out. Sometimes we put a medication on top of it. And then it might need to be scooped out every couple of months. Uh, the difference between the porokeratoma and the other, other callus is you can see the size. So one has a, a big size, and then one has a very, very teeny size. And the bigger size one, once again, it's trimmed down as well, but it's a bigger surface area, and it tends to be a little bit less painful. And one question that I always get, even from people with diabetic, that are diabetic, they ask me, well, is this a callus or is this a wart? Normally in diabetics, it's very rare to see warts. We see warts in children more or younger people. In some of the older diabetics, we don't see warts as much. But usually when you trim off a wart, you have little, pluck, uh, little pinpoint areas of bleeding in that area. Uh, interdigital lesions, uh, these are not, this is not athlete's foot. This is actually caused by rubbing of the bones. You can see the example of the bones here. And what happens between the toes is that the rubbing of the bones between these cause that really bad callus, and they can also cause wounds between there. There are some treatments for that. You can try some toe spacers. You can also shave down the bones to make that better. Another problem can be ingrown toenails, like we showed uh, the example prior uh, with that other previous patient. You can remove this ingrown toenail. Uh, you can sometimes, if it, if it happens multiple times, you can put an acid in the edge and do a procedure called a matrixectomy that kills out the edge, and then, then that won't be a problem in the future. Uh, once again, you have to be careful if you have uh, diabetes and if you think you have an ingrown toenail, because occasionally people with diabetes, they think they have ingrown toenails, and it might not be an ingrown toenail. Uh, a lot of times, patients that come in with a kind of a red-hot, swollen big toe, it could be poor circulation. If you have poor circulation and, and you think it's an ingrown toenail, uh, it, it may not be, and I've had some patients like that. They come in thinking it's an ingrown toenail, and it, it's really not. So you have to really be careful and determine is the problem circulation or not. And this is kind of a strong photo here, but this is an ulcer on the bottom. Once again, a dermatological consideration here you have to look at for a, a high-risk foot. An ulcer is a hole in the bottom, and this is a, a very strong picture here. This patient has an infection. So we're not going to stay here that long for this. And once again, this is a real complex patient as well. This is a an example of some debridement of a patient with a Charcot foot. It's good to know what Charcot foot is. Charcot is when your foot collapses and you can develop a sore on the bottom of the foot. This is a very serious condition that you should be seeking medical help out, but this is something that's a combination of a bony problem as well as a skin problem. Next, we're going to go on to talk a little bit about some of the nerve problems that can happen on the bottom of the foot. And there are a couple of tests that you probably have had by your doctor. One is on the right, you can see the tuning fork test. It's where you uh, tap the tuning fork and you vibrate the big toe at the tip. If you can't feel that, you probably have neuropathy. And you tend to lose the vibration first before you lose the sensation. And that Sims-Weinstein test on the left there are different areas that you push on, that your doctor would push on. And if you can't feel those, it probably indicates that you have neuropathy. Well, what is neuropathy? Well, Neuropathy is where the nerves that go down to your feet aren't working anymore. And there are, are different types of neuropathy. Many people come in, they complain of painful neuropathy. And with painful neuropathy, you can take different types of medications. You can take uh, different types of supplements that can sometimes help it. 
But with a non-painful neuropathy, it's actually more dangerous because if you don't have any feeling, you could step on something or have something in your shoe, and that could be a big problem. So you have to check the nerves out. Uh, some musculoskeletal considerations. Uh, here are some different uh, foot deformities that can happen. Uh, this is kind of a bad foot. Not everyone has a bad foot like this, but we saw some of these examples before. On the top, you can see a patient with a, a toe that's curved up like a hammer toe, and the other one has a really bad bunion with a hammer toe. Both of these are problems you can imagine to find shoes. And once again, if you wear a shoe that's improper, it could cause a blister, it could cause a wound, an ulcer on the top of the toe. These foot deformities can be corrected. This is the other example that we showed before of the hammer toes, and those can be corrected for this patient, making sure that they do have enough uh, circulation to allow this to heal. This is another example that we showed before of a hammer toe that can be corrected. And here is a, there's some uh, idea behind doing some corrective surgery. This is an example on the bottom of a patient that a bunion and a hammer toe corrected uh, for this condition. And the picture on the top, I just wanted to show you, that's an example of a Charcot foot. Uh, you may hear this word Charcot. Basically, the simple way of explaining it is if you have diabetes and neuropathy, and you maybe step the wrong way or sprain your ankle or sprain your foot, and you don't notice it, and you, you think that uh, nothing happened, but your foot kind of swells up, uh, a lot of times this can be mistaken for something we call cellulitis. But if you're foot really swells up and it gets red hot and swollen and there's no wound or no ulcer, a lot of times it's a Charcot foot. And uh, if this solidifies, and this takes, just, a, just so you know, it takes about six months for that foot break to heal, uh, especially uh, if you, and even if you stay off, you have to stay off of it for about six months. And, and this could be a problem. And there are some surgeries to correct for this by shaving off the bump on the bottom. And there are some bigger reconstructive surgeries that can be done as well. Uh, once again, something to think about if your foot is red hot and swollen, and we typically see this with patients that go into the emergency room into the hospital, they have a foot that's red hot and swollen, and, and it gets better when they're in bed because their foot's elevated and they're on IV antibiotics, and that redness then, when they put their foot back down, comes back. And they think, well, it's because the infection is still there. Well, a lot of times it's not the infection, but it's this condition called Charcot foot. What's the standard treatment? Uh, it says six months of NWB, that means non-weight bearing. So you have to find a way to stay off your foot. On the bottom right, you can see the knee roller. On the bottom left, you can see a pro boot. So once the foot is more stable, that's a big boot, kind of looks like Darth Vader boot, and you would be in there to help uh, take the pressure off of your foot uh, while it's healing. Okay? And uh, we're also going to look here at some of the circulation considerations. So some of the circulation, how are the pulses? Is there a problem? Are there palpable pulses? Uh, do you have uh, Dopplerable? Doppler is a machine that you put on there, you can hear the pulses. Uh, ABIs or ankle brachial index is where they put blood pressure cuffs around different segments. And pulse volume recordings are actually looking at the volume of the, of the blood flow that it goes through there. And an MRA is like an MRI, okay, magnetic resonance imaging or angiography. It looks at the, at the arteries in that area to see if there's any problems with the circulation. These are all done, typically, uh, some of the more advanced ones are done by a vascular surgeon. Some of the simpler ones, like checking the pulses or Dopplers, can be done by your doctor or your podiatrist. I put the picture on the upper right-hand corner, because you have to be careful. Sometimes these ingrown toenails aren't just ingrown toenails, and it could be a circulatory problem, and it can lead to an amputation you can see on the bottom. Some of the shoe gear considerations that are important, you have to look at the type of the shoe, the fit, the lining, any insoles. Now everyone says, well, I don't want to wear a diabetic shoe because it's ugly. And uh, there was a doctor locally who I worked with, and he said, well, it's much better to have an ugly shoe than it is to have no foot. So you have to really be careful. Uh, shoes can be very helpful to prevent problems, especially if you've had a, an ulcer or a wound or an amputation. Uh, diabetic shoes are a must, and there are a lot of different providers that can help you with those. Uh, some of the statistics, uh, just for those that are uh, interested, uh, uh, ulcer is one of the most common complications. The annual incidence is 1 to 4 percent. So if you have diabetes, uh, 1 to 4 percent of the time you're going to have a yearly an ulcer, 15 to 25 percent. So about a quarter of people with diabetes will get an ulcer in their lifetime, and 15 percent of these lead to an amputation. Those are really, really uh, difficult circumstances to look at. 85 percent of amputations are preceded by an ulcer. So almost all of the ulcers uh, lead, that lead into amputations are, start with an ulcer. That's the main cause. Okay? 
and then peripheral neuropathy or lack of feeling is a, a big risk factor or cause. Uh, here, uh, we're just going to look at some of the classification systems uh, of it. This is kind of beyond the scope. This is more for those uh, other ones. But you can look it up if you'd like afterwards at the Wagner classification, uh, the different phases of wound healing. You can look that up as well. Wound healing is very, very difficult. And here are just some examples of wounds that did heal with proper treatment. Another example, another example that eventually did heal. A wound on a heel that healed, the top of the foot. Kind of some bad pictures here, scary pictures. Here's one that led to an amputation, but it did heal after someone took care of it. Some kind of scary pictures here. So we're just going through these quickly because these are strong pictures. Very costly to treat these. You can see some of the examples right here. Uh, these are very, very expensive to treat. And this is one of the most shocking examples here. The five-year mortality rate for an ulcer is about 45%. And uh, that's right at the same area of colon cancer. And uh, so this is something very serious that you should take account of if you have diabetes, if you've developed an ulcer, it's something that's very serious to look at. So what are the diabetic foot care recommendations? Well, basically, it's a yearly comprehensive diabetic foot exam by a podiatrist. Uh, yearly diabetic foot footwear evaluation, getting them every every four months you should switch them out. And every two to three months you should get uh, nail care based on your symptoms. And the most important thing I can recommend for those that are watching this is a daily foot evaluation by yourself. And if you can't see it, a daily foot evaluation by some member of your family. Uh, everyone wants to know who qualifies, and this is specific to the endocrinologist that we're watching this. Now here are some of the qualifications of those that qualify for diabetic foot care. Here are some of the qualifications for those that get diabetic shoes. You, not everyone gets the shoes, but you have to have an amputation or previous ulcer, a foot deformity or poor circulation. And then uh, here are some, they asked me for some board questions uh, in finishing. So uh, since you guys aren't going to be taking your boards on endocrinology, I'm going to be skipping some of these, but I'll just go over them if you want to look at them. What are some of the major risk factors for diabetes? developing an ulcer. What percentage of diabetics will develop a foot ulcer? We talked about that 15 to 25 percent. How do you do a diabetic foot exam? We also explained that a little bit. And what is, the, what is important when treating diabetic foot ulcers? These are some important points right here. You want to evaluate the circulation, clear up any infection, uh, debride, that means taking off all the bad tissue, and then offload the area. And so thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture on uh, diabetic ulcers. Just to remember, this was for endocrinologists or those that are treating diabetes, and that's kind of the level of this lecture, but I think it's going to be helpful for all of those that are watching here. Thank you.